Thank you for having me. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Um, I'll be talking about diagnosis and multimodal management of soft tissue injuries of the thoracic limb. Just a few disclosures, some of the companies that I do consulting work for, obviously this uh, talk is sponsored by Zomedica, and then some of the companies that I have research funding through. So in general practice, I was frustrated by forelimb lameness a lot. Uh, in veterinary school, I remember learning an orthopedic exam. We learned how to examine the range of motion of the carpus and the elbow and the shoulder, and basically all of the soft tissue structures were kind of secondary and left out. And so when I saw them in practice, I'd be like, okay, well, they're lame and their range of motion in their joints is normal. There's no effusion. So now what? And, you know, some of these cases, you know, sometimes they'll have pain somewhere and sometimes they won't. And sometimes they'll walk in and they're completely normal. And the owner's like, well, I swear they limp after activity. Or, you know, when they get up in the morning, they're lame and you're like, mm, I can't find anything. And often these cases have no history of a traumatic event. And so you take radiographs and some, most of the time they're normal. And so what do you do? You put them on rest and incense. And in two weeks, they're probably a little bit better. And then they go back to activity and they become lame again. So then what do you do? And so that's, that's where I come in and I, you know, it was, it was interesting when I went to my rehab training because there were a lot of things that I learned that I was like, man, I really wish I had learned this in school because it would have made a huge difference in my practice. So that's kind of my goal for tonight is to give you guys some tips on things you can look for for soft tissue injuries, how to diagnose them, and then what do we do about treatment. So here's a typical forelimb lameness that you're like, mm, yep, they're lame. So where is it localized to? So thorough examination is a key. And the first thing you wanna do is make sure that you're differentiating between orthopedic and a neurologic lameness. And this is gonna rely on both the detailed orthopedic examination, but also your neurologic examination to rule out neurologic disease. And the big thing for these is to not overlook the soft tissue structures. Most of our orthopedic exams were taught to us by orthopedic surgeons who a lot of times focus on the bones. And so you're like, yep, carpus, elbow, shoulder. What else is there? All the soft tissues. So the goals for today will be to kind of review some of the often missed soft tissue injuries of the thoracic limb. So some of the things that I see that come to me after they've been lame for a while that I can diagnose, but you guys can diagnose and practice too. So these are things that I see that you can definitely find yourself if you know what you're looking for and where to look. And then to talk a little bit about kind of the multimodal management options for treatment of these tendon and ligament injuries. So we'll start with the carpus and kind of work our way up. And so orthopedic exam of the carpus, obviously you wanna do your typical orthopedic examination. So evaluating for effusion, evaluating for crepitus, looking for any sort of periarticular thickening, and then laxity. When you're checking for range of motion, you wanna make sure that you're not just doing flexion and extension, but you're also doing pronation and supination, and then valgus and varus stress tests. So that'll check your uh, lateral and medial collateral type ligaments. So all of those um, ligaments uh, through the stress test. Once you do your kind of general examination of the carpus, now we can try to figure out, you know, if there's thickening, if there's, you know, focal swelling that's not necessarily a fusion with the carpus, what structures are they? And so one of the things that I see fairly commonly in active breed dogs is the abductor pollicis longus tenosynovitis. And so the origin of the abductor pollicis longus is on the lateral surface of the radius and ulna. And then it inserts on the proximal aspect of the first metacarpal bone. And the action is an abductor of the first digit 
an adductor of the carpus and a medial stabilizer. And this one is kind of cool because it's one that you can actually pretty much definitively diagnose with radiographs alone. It has a pretty um, unique appearance on radiographs. Uh, so that's, that's kind of nice in a general practice setting. Usually these guys have a chronic mild forelimb lameness, but that's pretty much all of our forelimb lamenesses. They're chronic mild forelimb lamenesses. These dogs will often have a visible or palpable firm swelling medial to the distal radius. And so you can see in the image that swelling that that dog has, this doesn't feel like a fusion. So it's not kind of a soft, squishy swelling. It's more of a firm swelling. And when you take radiographs, they'll have an enthesopathy and kind of bony proliferation along the radial sulcus. So where those white arrows are in the radiographs. We can musculoskeletal ultrasound these cases, but most of the time the radiographs are pretty diagnostic. Uh, sometimes I will ultrasound them more for imaging in order to kind of follow through and follow up with them. And so just some more radiographs of kind of that unique appearance. And then an anatomic diagram and kind of musculoskeletal ultrasound, you can actually identify that abductor pollicis longus on ultrasound. The ultrasound images in this case are all normal. So these are normal anatomy images. The next kind of carpal soft tissue injury that we see on a fairly regular basis is the flexor carpi ulnaris tendinopathy. And the flexor carpi ulnaris, just to kind of review your anatomy, consists of two bellies. It has an ulnar head and a humeral head, and they converge into a single tendon inserting on that, that accessory carpal bone. And the action of the flexor carpi ulnaris is to flex the forepaw and then abduct. These dogs, once again, usually have kind of a mild chronic intermittent lameness. They will often have kind of a firm swelling at the, that insertion point on that accessory carpal bone. They will often have pain on hyperextension of the carpus, but not always. The, this, this case, radiographs are sometimes helpful, but often not. Sometimes you'll see that soft tissue swelling at that insertion on the accessory carpal bone. And sometimes you'll see mineralization or calcification of the tendon but sometimes these guys can be pretty normal on radiographs. And so I typically choose musculoskeletal ultrasound to image them, um, but you know, radiographs can sometimes be at least helpful in, in localizing. And so this, these are some radiographs of, on the left-hand side, just that soft tissue swelling at that insertion point on the accessory carpal bone. And then on the right-hand side, a case that actually had some mineralization of that tendon. So this is an interesting one um, because it, the uh, ligament isn't even labeled in the anatomy textbook. And so I started seeing some of these cases where there was a focal swelling on the lateral aspect of the carpus. They were typically kind of painful on flexion and I was like, okay, what lives in that area? So you pull out your anatomy textbook and they're like, okay, what lives in that area? And you're like, oh good, an unlabeled ligament. <laughs> so there, it is, it does have a name. It's the accessorio metacarpal ligament. And it originates on the lateral aspect of the accessory carpal bone. And it inserts on the base of the fifth metacarpal. And so the study is that are, that are published are on a vulsion of this ligament, and it's most commonly seen in racing greyhounds. So they'll completely avulse it. The accessory carpal bone will actually kind of pop up dorsally, but I'm seeing it in active breed and sporting dogs where they're just getting a desmitis. So they're getting inflammation and breakdown of the ligament without actual avulsion. Once again, kind of the mild intermittent lameness, often worse after activity. And then they have a firm swelling kind of along the caudolateral aspect of the carpus. 
And so you can sort of see it in this image of the dog where the, the arrow is, the, that kind of firm swelling right along with that, uh, where that ligament runs. Uh, the cases that I've seen typically have pain on flexion of the carpus with reduced range of motion. So what do we do to diagnose it? Radiographs are fairly unhelpful. Um, sometimes you'll see enthesopathy, sometimes you'll see soft tissue swelling, but the cases that I've had, we've been diagnosing them with musculoskeletal ultrasound. So this is that dog that was in the previous image. The image on the right was the left carpus, so that was his normal one. And then the image on the right was his abnormal one. So you can see that the radiographs are fairly unremarkable. There's just a little bit of soft tissue swelling kind of on that lateral aspect of the carpus. And in most of these cases, at least, you know, if I had gotten this case when I was in general practice, I'd be like, yep, there's a little bit of soft tissue swelling, probably a sprain or strain, rest in NSAIDs. But in these cases, a lot of times that'll help temporarily, but as soon as they go back to activity, they tend to have recurrence of lameness. So you'll notice that I kind of skipped the elbow. Um, most of the time when we see elbow associated lameness, it's elbow dysplasia. There are not a lot of soft tissue injuries that we see uh, associated specifically with the elbow. Now, a caveat to that is the bicep does insert um, distal to the elbow. So sometimes they will have elbow pain when they have bicep issues, but we'll talk about bicep kind of separately in association with the shoulder. So the shoulder anatomy is, is quite complicated. And so that does make diagnosis of shoulder injuries fairly challenging. Um, so the shoulder has both passive stabilizers and active stabilizers. The passive stabilizers include the glenoid cavity and that kind of joint fluid cohesion. And then there are so essentially collateral ligaments of the shoulder, and that's the medial and lateral glenohumeral ligaments. And then the joint capsule is also a passive stabilizer. And then you have a whole set of active stabilizers. So the medial stabilizer is the subscapularis, and then you have lateral stabilizers, which are the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor. And then kind of less importantly, your bicep, tricep, and deltoid. Of course, my dog is barking. <laughs> Um, so your, your main stabilizers, active stabilizers of the shoulder are the subscapularis, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor. So those four. The bicep is actually not as important in stabilizing, at least according to the biomechanical studies. And then you also have your tricep, your deltoid, your teres major, and your coracobrachialis. So all of those structures help to stabilize the shoulder. And then some anatomy photos, you can see kind of the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, bicep, all of those. And then broken down further, you've got your teres minor and your coracobrachialis. And so when you're doing your shoulder examination, your flexion should be about 30 to 40 degrees, extension kind of 165, 170 then also making sure you check abduction and adduction. And then there are kind of special tests that you can use like the medial glenohumeral joint glide, um, which is kind of like a drawer test for the shoulder. Um, in the shoulder abduction test is a little bit controversial on using it to diagnose medial shoulder instability, which we won't specifically talk about today, um, but you can use it kind of in combination with your other findings and in comparison side to side to evaluate for kind of that medial shoulder instability, but it's not completely diagnostic. 
And then you can also check your flexibility of the muscles and tendons in the shoulder. So just like for us, you know, if we go to PT, they'll have you go through range of motion and then they'll have you check your tricep flexibility. We can check flexibility of all of those shoulder muscles in dogs. So you can check the flexibility of the bicep, you can check the flexibility of the tricep, you can check the flexibility of the pectoral muscles and the trapezius muscles, the rhomboids. And then when you are assessing kind of those muscles and tendons, you're also assessing for pain and atrophy because that can give you an indication of where the problem is. So the, the big one that I really wanna focus on is the bicep test. And anytime you're checking for flexibility of a muscle, you're doing the opposite of the action of the muscle. So the action of the bicep is to extend the shoulder and flex the elbow. So in order to stretch the bicep or check that flexibility, you're going to want to flex the shoulder and extend the elbow. Now, the thing that I don't like about this image is the scapula isn't being stabilized. And so if you think about kind of that scapular girdle, that scapula kind of floats free on the body. And so if you don't stabilize the scapula and you just try to flex the shoulder and extend the elbow, that scapula is going to rotate. And that can give you a kind of a falsely normal or falsely increased kind of bicep flexibility. And so you really want to stabilize the scapula first, then flex the shoulder, and then extend the elbow. And the paw should reach the level of the stifle. That would be normal. So kind of generally, and this isn't, you know, 100%, but if you have decreased flexibility, so that paw does not reach the stifle, but you don't have any pain or discomfort then it's likely a tight muscle or, or some or trigger points in that area that are restricting the, the mobility of that muscle. If you have decreased flexibility and you have pain on palpation of the tendon, then that gives you a pretty good indication that you potentially have a tendinopathy associated with that bicep. If you have increased flexibility and no muscle resistance, then that's a good indication that that bicep is actually torn. So this dog, just to give you kind of a background, um, hunting dog that at about a year of age presented with forelimb leanness. The left side, so the one that you're gonna see first, is almost normal, but not quite. So she's got a little bit of decreased flexibility. She's not entirely comfortable. She does have a mild bicep tendinopathy on the left side. Um, but it'll be a really obvious comparison to the right side, or if it works, if I play the video. So stabilizing that scapula. So I use one hand to kind of stabilize the scapula and flex, and then use the other hand to extend that elbow. And so you can see it doesn't quite reach the stifle, but it's pretty close. And you should get muscle resistance because you're stretching the muscle and the tendon, you should feel kind of a resistance at that endpoint. Now you can see on this one, I'm extending that elbow and there is zero resistance. So it kind of just flops in the wind and I can play that again. So she actually has a torn bicep on the right side. So you can see kind of that resistance when I get to that end range, that resistance is normal because she has an intact muscle and tendon. And then on this side, when I go to stabilize that scapula, flex the, the shoulder, and then extend the elbow, there's just nothing holding it together. I mean, there are lots of other shoulder muscles. Mom was actually worried that her shoulder was going to fall off without the bicep, but I assured her that that was not the case because there were lots of other muscles involved. So bicep tendinopathies typically are large breed active dogs. This is the most commonly reported injury in agility dogs. So those of you that see agility in sporting dogs, this is a super common injury in those sporting dogs but we see it in 
all large breed active dogs. I see it a ton in dogs that play fetch. Um, even if they're not technically sporting or active dogs, the just that repetitive stress injury. Uh, typically they're middle-aged to older, but I am seeing it in fairly young sporting dogs. So even like a year to 18 months of age. Typically they're not traumatic in nature. Um, I've seen a couple that are traumatic where the dog actually runs into something. Uh, but in general, we think that it's probably kind of a chronic repetitive stress overuse type injury. Usually they're weight bearing lameness. It's usually, it can be acute. Sometimes it's chronic that worsens with activity. Sometimes it's intermittent. Usually the ones that they, that they actually tear are typically worse lameness. So they'll usually still be weight bearing, but more lame than just kind of the chronic tendinopathy ones. So primary or secondary? Uh, primary are strains or tears, so a primary problem in the bicep. We also see bicep tendinopathies as secondary. So what happens with secondary is there's impingement by extra articular structures. And usually this is the supraspinatus. So if you think about your anatomy, your bicep runs pretty medially kind of in that intertubercular groove. The supraspinatus sits extra articularly, but inserts pretty close to that bicep. So if they have a supraspinatus issue and that supraspinatus gets enlarged, it can actually impinge and put pressure on the bicep and cause a bicep tendinopathy. So that's why when we're looking at doing diagnostics, we want to be able to try to tell between the bicep and the supraspinatus to say, is there pathology in just one or is there pathology in both? Um, typically, it's a cr chronic degenerative condition. And, you know, like we talked about, we can have acute ruptures, but that's rare. I've only seen that in a couple of cases and that typically those traumatic ones where they actually run into something. Um, the ruptures that I see are typically more chronic. So they're the chronic tendinopathies that just get worse and worse and worse until they tear. Uh, and usually the tears occur close to the origin. Um, they're typically not avulsions. Uh, they typically occur kind of in that substance of the tendon. So the tendon gets diseased, has pathology, and then kind of tears all the way through. So what about the supraspinatus? Hold on. I will actually answer some, I'm trying to think, I've got some questions and I will probably, I can probably answer some of those now. Um, so advice for testing bicep for tendinopathy in patients that have elbow joint pathology. That's a good one because a lot of times the dogs that have shoulder tendinopathies, whether that's supraspinatus or bicep, have them secondary to other orthopedic disease. So there was a study that looked at supraspinatus tendinopathies and found that over half of them had other primary orthopedic disease. Most of those were elbow, um, but there were also some that had shoulder pathology. And so there, it is really hard sometimes to localize pain when they have disease in both the shoulder and the elbow. Um, a lot of times, you know, what I do is I work my way distal and work my way proximal. So I will actually be checking the elbow first. Usually the dogs that have bicep tendinopathy and elbow joint pathology have enough elbow joint pathology that you can say, okay, yeah, definitely they're painful in the elbow. They've got a fusion, there's crepitus, there's periarticular thickening. And then I'm pretty careful about that bicep um, when I go to stretch it because obviously you are manipulating the elbow. And so that kind of feeds in um, to Dr. Wall's question about localizing pain in the region of the tendon of the origin of the bicep. So yes, I'm palpating also the each muscle and tendon individually. And so I will palpate that bicep. I will palpate the supraspinatus. 
And sometimes that's a good way to kind of help you localize when you have disease in that elbow as well, because then you're not manipulating the elbow. You can palpate. And the thing to remember for the bicep is it's a lot more medial than people think it is. It sits pretty medially in that intertubercular groove. So you have to be able to kind of palpate medially. And sometimes it helps to externally rotate that shoulder to really get in there and be able to palpate, especially in the really fat dogs. Um, and so that kind of leads nicely into, you know, the next section talking about supraspinatus because a lot of times it is hard to differentiate between the two, palpation does really come in handy. Um, so supraspinatus, kind of like bicep, often large breed active dogs. This is also pretty common in working in agility dogs, typically middle-aged to older. But once again, some of the sporting and working dogs, we're seeing it younger. Lameness, it's, this one's kind of interesting because Supraspinatus is very often bilateral, but usually we see a unilateral lameness with these cases. And it's often kind of a chronic intermittent waxing and wane, waning lameness. So here's kind of a, your typical forelimb lameness. So supraspinatus tendinopathies, because of the, you know, origin on that, that uh, scapula and where it inserts, they will often have pain on flexion of the shoulder. And so I will palpate kind of in neutral, but I'll also palpate in flexion. Can, I'll palpate along that entire length in that supraspinatus fossa, and then all the way to the insertion on that greater tubercle. And once again, because the bicep and the supraspinatus sit so close together, you can palpate the tendons individually, but if you've got you know, an enlarged supraspinatus and it's impinging the bicep, you can often just have global pain in that area and it can be hard to differentiate. So that's when diagnostics come in handy. Um, radiographs, we often do start with them. Um, a lot of times they're fairly unhelpful, but you know, in these kind of middle-aged to older large breed dogs, we want to make sure we're not dealing with some sort of you know proximal humeral osteosarcoma, especially like that video of the Rottweiler. You know, first thing I think of lame Rottweiler, and like make sure we rule out you know uh, osteosarc. So radiographs are always good. The one thing that we can do is a skyline view. Um, because this kind of gives us an image that will help us differentiate localization of the bicep and supraspinatus. And then we also have options of musculoskeletal ultrasound, CT, MRI, and arthroscopy. So CT, I often will do, not because it's helpful for the diagnosis of the soft tissues of the shoulder, but because we know that a lot of this, the soft tissue tendinopathies of the shoulder can have sec other underlying orthopedic disease, I'm often trying to rule out, you know, underlying elbow dysplasia. Um, so I will often do CT. There are reports of using MRI for supraspinatus tendinopathies, but obviously at that point you're getting, you know, it's quite a bit more expensive. You've got general anesthesia. Um, so I do that fairly infrequently. And then you've got arthroscopy. So arthroscopy, you can visualize your interarticular structures. So bicep runs interarticularly, you can visualize that. You can also use it to visualize kind of those medial shoulder structures. So your subscapularis tendon and your medial glenohumeral ligament evaluating for that medial shoulder instability but it's not helpful for supraspinatus because that supraspinatus sits extra articularly. So radiographs ruling out other pathologies. They may be normal if the tendinopathy is non-calcifying. So sometimes tendons will become mineralized and you'll see changes on radiographs where you'll have mineralization in the bicep or supraspinatus or both. But in a lot of cases, they don't have mineralization, and then the radiographs are going to be, going to be normal. 
Sometimes you'll have kind of sclerosis in that intertubercular groove, but it's not a defining, you know, diagnostic for the shoulder tendinopathies. That skyline view can help you determine the localization of the mineralization. But once again, if you don't have mineralization, it's not going to be helpful. So images, um, A, you have a little bit of kind of sclerosis, B, you have more, and you've got obviously degenerative joint disease in the shoulder. And then the D is that skyline view for the bicep. So you've got mineralization in that intertubercular groove. So you know that that is the lo localization of the bicep. Unlike this one where you've got supraspinatus, where you've got mineralization, but it's not sitting in that groove. So that skyline view, it's a little bit more lateral. So that can say, okay, there's mineralization, but what does the mineralization tell us? Sometimes not a whole lot because it can be a chronic incidental change. There are studies that show that you can take radiographs and sometimes you just find incidental mineralization in the bicep or supraspinatus and they might not even have any lameness. So taking your radiographic findings in combination with your exam findings is super important just like everything else. But then the reason that I really like musculoskeletal ultrasound for these cases is we can actually visualize the bicep and the supraspinatus. We can differentiate between the two and we get a better idea of whether if there's mineralization, is it just kind of chronic mineralization, but the tendon actually doesn't look too bad or is there obvious active tendon pathology. And so the kind of images on the left-hand side of the screen are normal images of the bicep. So you've got your superglenoid tubercle and then your bicep tendon kind of runs and then you've got your humeral, your humerus. And that's a nice fiber pattern. You can see it's kind of uniform, um, hyperechoic. And then on the right side of the screen is the kind of same view of the bicep that's diseased. And so this was actually the image of the bicep from that short hair pointer. And you can see where those arrows are, are little mineralizations. And then the actual bicep tendon itself is really enlarged. The fiber pattern is irregular. There are areas that are hypoechoic. Um, there's actually a little bit of joint effusion as well. So, you know, that tells you that there's pathology and, you know, likely active pathology as well. So I'm just checking questions. Um, do I ever use digital thermography? I do not. Um, usually I'm pretty good about localizing source of, or at least an area, just based on examination and palpation. Um, and then I do di you know, further diagnostics to, to identify the actual structures. Uh, I have had some cases where I really cannot localize anything. And for those, I've actually used nuclear scintigraphy, um, but that's kind of a whole nother, another ball game. And then you've also got, you know, if you're someplace that has access to like PET CT, that is actually even better, but we do not have a PET CT. Um, how can you do a skyline when you can't move the plate out of the bucky? That is a very good question. And I'm not the one to answer that. <laughs> Um, I obviously don't do my own radiographs anymore, so I, I can ask a radiologist and get back to you on that one. Uh, so musculoskeletal ultrasound continuing for the bicep. Um, this is the transverse. So kind of through the bicep, you can see on the left-hand side, normal images. And then on the right-hand side, um, that same dog where you have kind of an irregular pattern, 
uh, there's actually kind of some hypoechoic, you know, lines through that tendon. And this was before she actually tore it completely, but most likely kind of those hypoechoic areas were some early kind of partial tearing of that tendon and then she just tore the rest of the way through. Musculoskeletal ultrasound for the supraspinatus. The supraspinatus is a little bit of an unusual one because if you're not familiar with how it looks on ultrasound, it can look a lot like pathology. It typically is pretty bulbous and hypoechoic, um, but the left is, on the left side, it's pr a pretty normal one. The right side has a lot of irregularity and mineralization in it. It doesn't even look like the left hand side. Um, so the right hand side is a uh, supraspinatus tendinopathy that was pretty mineralized. And so obviously in order to treat these tendon and ligament injuries, you need to be able to kind of localize what tendons and what ligaments are involved. Um, because a lot of times what we're doing isn't just a generalized treatment like rest and NSAIDs, we're actually doing more kind of focal targeted treatment. Uh, so that's why using one palpation skills and then imaging to try to localize what, you know, ligament are you dealing with? What tendon are you dealing with? Are you dealing with, you know, both supraspinatus and bicep? Because that kind of changes what we do. Um, but a lot of what we do for treatment of tendon and ligament injuries, there's a lot of overlap. Um, so that's kind of what we're going to talk about. And then how do these treatments vary a little bit based on what pathology I'm treating. Oh, good. Your radiologist actually answered in the, in the Q and A. So, um, <laughs> I'm glad she's on. Um, but I'll, I'll read that at the end if, if you guys don't have access to the actual Q&A. So treatment options, modalities. So photobiomodulation or laser therapy, uh, pulse electromagnetic field therapy, extracorporeal shockwave therapy are kind of the kind of big actual physical modalities that we use, orthobiologics, which could be a whole series of lectures in and of itself, and then these cases, I'm doing a lot of targeted therapeutic exercises as well. So photobiomodulation therapy or laser therapy, mechanism of action is that it stimulates mesenchymal cell proliferation, stimulates synthesis of collagen type one and two, and improves collagen or organization. And then it also decreases pro-inflammatory cytokines. And so this synthesis of collagen and collagen organization is particularly important for these tendon and ligament injuries, because we know that tendons and ligaments do not heal well, that when they do heal, they're never 100% normal. And so anything that we can do to improve that organization of that collagen is going to help with the overall tensile strength of the tendons and ligaments and potentially reduce the risk of re-injury. Now there's always going to be a higher risk of re-injury for tendons and ligaments after they have had pathology. So what do we know about photobiomodulation therapy in tendons and ligaments in dogs? Nothing, we have no studies. Um, so there are human and rat studies that show pretty good effects. So we kind of extrapolate that and assume that it also helps for these dog cases as well. The other problem with the laser therapy studies in general is that the protocols vary widely. So the actual kind of joules per centimeter squared vary widely. The actual frequency of treatments vary widely. And so we don't have a lot of good research that says this is the protocol that we should be using for tendons and ligaments. And so we extrapolate once again. So here's some of the studies that have been done in non-canine species. So we've got some in humans, we've got some in rats, that show improved kind of collagen reorganization um, and improved type one and type three collagen and vascular endothelial growth factor. 
and kind of that extracellular matrix reorganization. So all really important things for healing of tendons and ligaments. My protocol, now this is based on, remember zero research it, for tendons and ligaments is 20 joules per centimeter squared. And I typically aim to do it two to three times a week. So that's mine. Um, it'd be nice to actually see some studies for that, but at this point we don't have any. Pulse electromagnetic field therapy. The mechanism of this is it enhances the binding of calcium to calmodulin, which then activates the synthesis, synthesis of nitric oxide. And then that nitric oxide catalyzes guanyl synthesis, synthetase to cyclic GMP, which then downregulates IL-1 beta, INOS, and increases the vascular endothelial growth factor and fibroblast growth factor. The thing that I really like about these targeted uh, pulse electromagnetic field therapy, so like the Assisi loop, is this is something that the owners can do at home. And so for things like laser therapy and shockwave and you know the rehab, they're coming into the clinic, which some patients you know behaviorally can't do that, or the clients just cannot bring them in. That just logistics, they can't do it, or financially they can't afford to do you know kind of the multimodal treatment. And so the, the, the kind of those targeted pulse electromagnetic therapy loops like the Assisi loop are a nice option. And then it's also something that they can do every day at home. And even if they're coming for rehab, we have them do it at home in between their sessions. Um, so that's a nice option. And a lot of times, especially for these active breeds, sporting and working dogs, the owners are super dedicated. They want to be able to do something at home. And so giving them something that they can actually do with their dog at home is, is also a nice option. Extracorporeal shockwave therapy. So there are multiple types of shockwave therapy. The idea with the mechanism of action is that it's a focused high velocity sound wave. And there are actually three types of shockwave, and then there's radial shockwave that isn't true shockwave. Um, the pulse vet pro pulse is an electrohydraulic unit, uh, but you also have piezoelectric un uh, units um, that are pretty common in, in practice. But the idea be behind the shockwave is that it exerts a direct and indirect mechanical force on the bone and soft tissue and muscle. It protects chondrocytes, it can disintegrate calcifications, and then it recruits stem cells to treatment sites. And so when we're thinking about the tendinopathies, especially the mineralized tendinopathies, the shockwave therapy is really nice because it can help to disintegrate calcifications. And it's interesting because in the human studies, in human medicine, they actually classify their tendinopathies a lot more than we do. We just say it's a tendinopathy. And sometimes we'll grade it based on ultrasound. But in humans, they actually have a bunch of subclassifications of tendinopathies. And so they have calcific and non-calcific, and then they have subclassifications from there. So whether there's mineralization or not. And they've actually shown that the ones that have that mineralization, so those calcific tendinopathies, have better improvement with the shockwave therapy than the non-calcific tendinopathies. So obviously the kind of calci the effects on calcifications is, is a big mechanism of action for these cases and why they have improvement. And so kind of a diagram of that, the effects of that kind of physical shockwave, you've got kind of an immediate biological response, release of cytokines, release of growth factor, release of BMP. So you have kind of that bone regeneration and healing. We use this actually a lot for kind of um, slow healing or poorly healing fractures. But for the tendons, you know, we want to kind of improve the healing process and disintegrate some of those calcifications. Study-wise on tendons and ligaments, we actually do have some studies in dogs, um, not a lot of really like great evidence ones, um, mostly retrospective studies. So this was a study uh, 
that looked um, retrospectively at dogs that had supraspinatus and bicep tendinopathies. They also typically, they combine them with therapeutic exercises and 85% of dogs had good to excellent outcome. Um, so while the study had some significant limitations, 85% improvement in these cases is actually pretty good considering most of the time, by the time I'm seeing, um, especially the supraspinatus cases, they have usually been lame for at least six months, sometimes like a year and a half to two years by the time I see them. Um, we actually, you know, looked back at our cases and I think the average lameness or time frame before presentation to us was like 14 months. So pretty significant amount of time. So the fact that 85% of dogs had a good to excellent outcome after they had been going through courses of rest and NSAIDs and treatment at their primary vet um, is, is pretty positive. This is a human study looking at combining uh, exercise with uh, shockwave for treatment of supraspinatus, once again, that calcific tendinopathy, and both groups had significant decrease in pain and improvement in upper limb function. So typically for our protocol, um, we're using the pulse vet unit we either use a five millimeter trode or the 20 millimeter trode, and that depends on the size of the patient and the location. Um, a lot of the supraspinatus dogs, the ones that aren't like active sporting breed dogs are morbidly obese labs. We see it, uh, I have so many patients currently that are so fat that have supraspinatus tendinopathies. And so those I use the 20 millimeter because I'm like five millimeters is not even going to go through that fat. Um, energy, I set it on E5, 360 pulses per minute. And then pulses, if it's just the bicep or just the supraspinatus, I'll do 1,000. If it's both the uh, supraspinatus and the bicep, I'll do 1,500. And then if we're talking about some of those carpal you know, injuries, so your uh, excess accessorial metacarpal ligament desmitis, your abductor pollicis longus, your flexor carpi ulnaris, those all use 500 pulses. And then once again, we don't have a set protocol, but based on the Lehman study, it was three treatments kind of three to four weeks apart. And so that's what we've been sticking to just because we don't have any other, other research. But if you look at the human research, the protocols are all over the place. Some of them are multiple times a week. Some of them is like once a week. Some of it's, you know, more spread out. Um, so there's, do, there's not really a standardized treatment protocol on the human side either. Orthobiologics, um, once again, could be a whole set of lectures. There are a lot of different options when it comes to orthobiologics. Platelet-rich plasma is the one that we typically use, um, but there are other people who are using uh, stem cells or combined stem cells and PRP, but we do it because there are actually some kind of studies, um, mostly retrospective, but this study looked at the combination of the PRP and adipose-derived progenitor cells and so this is one of the hard things about looking at orthobiologic studies is a lot of times they're, you're comb they're combining. And so you're like, okay, well, how much of the effect is due to the PRP? How much is it due to the stem cell? Or is it actually a synergistic response and it's improved because you've got both? Um, so we really just need more studies kind of breaking out some of those orthobiologics. But these dogs had improved weight bearing, had reduction in tendon size after treatment. Um, and then another one where they actually, they use PRP, but bone marrow aspirate concentrate, and they had improvement in the fiber pattern on ultrasound, um, improvement in the echogenicity, improvement with the kind of size of the tendon. And so, you know, overall improvement with the orthobiologics. What we're using is the Arthrex Angel system, um, which is a PRP system. The, we typically, so the about 60 milliliters of whole blood yields about one to three millimeter or one to three mils of PRP, which is not a lot. So depending on what all we're injecting, 
most of these are large dogs. So I'll draw 120 mils so that I, I know I'm going to at least get a few mils of PRP processing is 20 minutes. And then we do sterile prep. Um, and then the injection process depends a little bit on what we're treating. And so for the ligament injuries, we're using ultrasound guided um, periligamous in injections. So for your flexor carpi ulnaris, your accessorio metacar you know, metacarpal, your abductor pollicis longus, those were all doing ultrasound guided. Um, the tendons, the shoulder tendons depends on which shoulder tendons are involved. So if you remember, supraspinatus is extra articular. So those ones were doing ultrasound guided kind of intra and peritendinous injections. For the bicep, it depends a little bit on the pathology. And so in the image on the right, you can see kind of that hypoechoic lesion. We call that a core lesion. If they have a core lesion, we're trying to actually target the PRP to that core lesion. If they don't have a core lesion, because that bicep runs intraarticularly, we can just put the PRP intraarticularly and not have to use ultrasound guided. Big thing to remember for these injections is that they typically have a mild increase in discomfort for 24 to 48 or 24 to 48 hours, but up to 72 hours after injection. So make sure that they're resting, which they should be anyways, if you're dealing with a soft tissue, you know, tendon or ligament that you're trying to heal. NSAIDs are controversial. Uh, in humans, they typically stop them. There was one study uh, in vitro in dogs that showed that NSAIDs didn't make any difference on growth factor concentrations in PRP. So maybe, maybe not. Um, if you can have them not on NSAIDs, great. And honestly, most of these cases with these tendon and ligament injuries, they're chronic. They're typically not that inflammatory. And so most of the time they don't even have improvement on NSAIDs. So a lot of these cases I don't have on NSAIDs, unlike my OA cases that I'm doing PRP for. Injection wise, typically we're doing kind of one to three injections about 30 days apart. And so I pair this with the shockwave. Um, and there was actually an in vitro study in equine that looked at using shockwave to kind of mechanically induce that growth factor release from the platelet. So it actually stimulates that, that platelet uh, release of the growth factors. And so what I'm doing in, and it's interesting because it varies kind of practitioner to practitioner. Some practitioners will shockwave first and then PRP, but based on, you know, this, this study in horses that, that showed, or at least in vitro, that there was an increase in growth factors I will inject PRP and then follow it up with shockwave. So kind of next category of treatment are strength exercises. And so this is what we're doing to help support the affected area. So we want to help build muscle to support the surrounding musculature and tendons. And our goal is also prevention of re-injury. And so exercise progression Isom we start with isometric exercises. So that's where your body is held in space without any flexion and extension of the joints. So essentially it's like the dog version of holding a plank. So holding a plank is an isometric exercise. You're not flexing and extending your joints, but as everybody who's held a plank knows, it can be quite challenging. It looks really easy, but if you hold it long enough, it's going to hurt. Um, so same with dogs. And I think you, the owners have to understand that, that they're like, oh man, that's like, you know, the weight shifting exercises are really, you know, look way easy. We want some of the hard exercises on these peanuts and balance balls. And a lot of times the isometric exercises are hard, the hardest for some of these dogs. And then open chain eccentric. So eccentric exercises are where the muscle is lengthened while it's engaged. And so open chain is where there's no weight put through the leg. So like a high five or wave would be open chain eccentric. Closed chain is where there's actually weight put through the paw. 
And so we go from open chain eccentric to closed chain concentric. So concentric is where that muscle is shortening and as it's contracting. So that would be like your bicep muscle when you're doing kind of the bicep curl portion of that. Now, when you go out for a bicep curl, that's an eccentric motion. And then we go to closed chain eccentric. So those are gonna be the most challenging where you're stretching that muscle while it's loaded, while there's weight through the paw. And then unlike people where you can kind of increase your weight, we don't have that option in dogs. So a lot of times what we'll do is we'll go from stable to unstable equipment. So we make them more unbalanced so they have to actually engage and work harder. So some of the strength exercise options for your isometric kind of posture work, weight shifting, three-legged stand, that open chain eccentric, so high five. And then you have kind of progressions from there depending on exactly what you're targeting. And then you can actually play around with shifting the body weight to change the load distribution. So if you want to make the exercises for the forelimb easier, you actually raise the forelimb, they shift their weight to their rear, and they're not loading the front as much. Then on the opposite end, like once they get stronger, you actually raise the rear end, shift the load to the front, and that makes it harder on the forelimbs. And then add in those unstable surfaces you can actually use exercise bands for resistance for dog exercises. Depends on the dog. My dog would say, absolutely not. Don't touch me with those. So it really just depends on the case. So posture exercises, once again, like your plank looks really easy. And your goal is to have them kind of in a square stack. So you want your radius and ulna to be perpendicular and you want your metatarsals to be perpendicular. Now he is close-ish sometimes, um, but he's only about, this video is about two weeks out after shoulder surgery. Um, so he's off waiting that, that right front. But I do start this on the ground um, and then move to kind of other surfaces. And so once you kind of go through the progressions, now there's there were multiple progressions in between the previous one and this one. So I don't jump straight to the really challenging stuff. But you can see how I his rear end is raised more than his front, so he's loading his front more. And I've added unstable equipment in both the front and the rear. And the reason he's got the paw pods partially is because he was cheating and externally rotating that front paw. And so using the paw pods helped him kind of target and keep more of a neutral alignment. But you can see kind of how I'm luring him forward a little bit. So he's getting that nice kind of perpendicular stance. He's actually a little overstretched in the rear there. So that's the posture work. And then that kind of open chain eccentric, so that wave, you can just start super easy. And this was just a couple weeks after surgery, so he doesn't really want to extend his shoulder, but I really want him to extend his shoulder more than that. And then once again, you can make that more challenging. So adding that unstable equipment and then asking him for that kind of wave. Now, once again, once in, in this position, he's not going to be able to get as much shoulder extension um, because of how he's weighted towards the front. But same sort of muscle engagement. And then if we're thinking about targeting some of those kind of abductor and adductor muscles doing sidestepping, once again, you can start this on the ground. In this case, obviously, I have his rear legs elevated just a little bit so that his weight is shifted forward. 
and then you can make it harder by adding unstable equipment. And because I'm asking him to step from ob kind of obstacle to obstacle, he's also got a little bit bigger of a range of motion side to side. And then backwards walking. You can, once again, start this on the floor, walking towards the dog and having them back up. Um, for him, I had his rear legs elevated and kind of targeted. And so that's, you know, engaging some of those tricep muscles, some of the lat muscles. Also a good core exercise. That's the thing with, you know, any of the exercises for our canine patients is because we can't put them on, you know, an exercise machine and just have them do a bicep curl. All of these exercises have kind of multiple effects and engage, you know, multiple portions of the body. So, you know, it is also, you know, working his pelvic limbs and his core, um, and how we kind of adjust kind of changes the muscle engagement. Uh, the play bow push-ups um, gets that kind of active range of motion for the shoulder. And once again, to make it easier, we actually elevate the forelimbs. So this is kind of the beginning stage where I don't want his front end loaded that much. So raising the forelimbs but still having him get that kind of active range of motion through the shoulders. And then progressing that to rear limbs elevated. And you can see kind of the really nice ex shoulder extension that he's getting in that. Now, obviously all of these are primarily targeting the shoulder. Carpal exercises are a lot harder because the, you're not, you don't have as many muscles and as much range of motion to target. And then you can also do kind of your more um, traditional push-ups. So like us doing tricep push-ups, Instead of kind of the play bow where they're getting extension, this you're actually getting kind of that flexion. And this is an advanced version. So once again, starting on the floor. But he's cheating on that right one. He's off waiting it. And that is all I've got for this evening. Sorry, I ran a few minutes over, um, but I'm happy to take any questions and I will pull up um, the question and answer. Uh, so Dr. Hennessy answered the question about the skyline view and the Bucky um, about how it can be done, but that it's less than textbook that you angle it a little bit, um, but it takes good sedation and visualization of the anatomy. Um, question about a laser. Um, for Laser, we are using a class four laser um, just because of the more recent studies, at least on the osteoarthritis side, that show that the actual laser dose is much higher than we originally kind of used protocols for, that we're looking at more of a 20 joule per centimeter squared. 
And for some of our kind of neuro like degenerative myelopathy cases, we're even looking at like 30 plus joules per centimeter squared. The class 3B lasers, because they can't be more than half of a watt, uh, would literally take your treatment times to multiple hours. And so the class four is just for speed for the number of patients that we're doing and the number of body parts that we're lasering. Um, we use the class four. We have a we actually have a two companion lasers is what we use uh, personally. Um, rear legs elevated, why? So it's that kind of weight shifting. So I, because I was working his four limbs in most of those exercises, I raised his rear legs to shift his weight forward. Now I will do those kind of flat on the ground initially, or if I'm trying to make them easier, I'll raise his front legs, but that's basically a weight distribution. So because we can't change weights like we can on the weight floor in people, we have to use that body weight to shift and get more loading of the forelimbs. Um, let's see, for chronic medial shoulder lameness, where there's no mineralization noted on musculoskeletal ultrasound, uh, what's your feeling on head-to-head -head comparison of companion animal therapy laser versus shockwave versus stem cell PRP. Um, I have a companion animal laser, but no access to shockwave. If we are basing it on research alone, shockwave is gonna win out um, just because we actually do have studies on using shockwave in dogs for tendon and ligament disease whereas we don't in for laser. Now, if you take into account the, you know, non-canine species studies, so humans and rats, then you've got some laser, um, uh, you know, evidence. But, and if you've got a laser in your practice, then use it, absolutely. Um, I find that the combination, that the shockwave tends to be more effective, at least, in my experience, and then the PRP in combination with the shockwave sometimes gets a bigger effect. Um, I don't PRP all of my cases. I will shockwave all of them. And then depending on the severity of the pathology, when it's, you know, more severe pathology, it's more chronic, I will PRP those. But I also have to take into account the, the cost for the owner. A lot of owners just can't afford multiple shockwave plus PRP treatments. And so I prioritize the shockwave. Um, if they can afford it all and they, you know, then I will, then I'll do both, especially since we're doing multiple treatments that that cost definitely adds up. Um, do we sedate them for the shockwave? Yes. Um, it's the, the, the new Propulse um, X-Trode is more comfortable, but it's still loud. Um, and so a lot of dogs just don't tolerate the noise very well. The, the, the ones that do are those hunting dogs, like the, um, the you know, short hair pointers. They're like, oh, we're used to gunshots. It's fine. We'll just stay in here and, and you can do it. But we also see a lot of, you know, German shepherds and other cases where they're just kind of sketchy anyways. Um, so we, we sedate them. We also are sedating them because a lot of times we're doing the PRP and we're doing musculoskeletal ultrasound. And so we're kind of doing it all, all you know, all together in one visit. Thoughts on therapeutic ultrasound. Um, I don't use it a lot in these cases. I, at least based on the studies, you know, we know that kind of the main, one of the main goals of therapeutic ultrasound is to heat the tissue and increase the extensibility. A lot of these cases don't have a lot of decreased flexibility or muscle tightness. They just, they have that kind of tendon pathology. And so I use the therapeutic ultrasound more for, 
kind of the, the dogs that have tight muscles. So if I've got, you know, a dog that has, or a dog that's post-op TPLO that has, you know, really shortened sartorius muscles that are really tight in their sartorius, or a dog that has, you know, really tight tricep muscles, I find that the ultrasound is, is a lot better for that. Um, but for these supraspinatus and bicep tendinopathies, or, you know, your carpal tendinopathies, I don't find a huge amount of use for it, at least over my other modalities. Um, can I talk more about class 3B versus class 4? So the 3B, um, based on like the actual kind of laws and regulations for how the lasers are classified, can't be more than half of a watt. The class 4 is are potentially more dangerous so that they can have a, they have a much higher power. So you can go from kind of that half a watt to, gosh, I think our companion laser goes to mm, over 15 watts. But because of that high power, you're also, you know, potentially at a higher risk of having, you know, thermal damage, um, burns and things like that if you're not careful. Um, but because we can crank up the power, we can deliver a much higher dose in a much shorter period of time because a watt is a joule per second. And so if you think about a half of a watt and if you're trying to figure out, you know, joules per centimeter squared and you've got, you know, if you've got a small area like one of the carpal tendons or ligaments, you know, the, the treatment time is not that much, but and honestly, for the shoulder tendon issues, it's probably not that much either. But a lot of the patients that we're doing laser on, at least in the rehab, like general rehab setting, are these morbidly obese labs that have terrible hip OA, stifle OA, elbow OA often all together. And so we're treating six joints in a hundred pound dog that you know, the, that treatment time really adds up. So the, the class four, the, the only difference is the speed of your treatment because of how, your power, how many joules you can deliver into a, you know, per second, essentially. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Uh, Bichette Markley. I do want to remind everybody that your CE certificate will be emailed to you uh, within a couple of days. And uh, I've had a lot of questions about um, the availability of this presentation. This evening's presentation was recorded and it will be posted on the Zometica.com website under the Zometica University tab. So if you want to go back and rewatch this to get some of this great information that was provided this evening, you'll be able to do so within a day or so when it is posted. And uh, with that, Dr. Bichette Markland, thank you so much for your time. It was great having you. Thanks and for having uh, me. We thank everyone for taking time out of your evening to join us for this great uh, presentation. We hope to see you on another Zometica sponsored webinar. And with that, I'm going to wish everybody have a great rest of your week and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Good night, everyone.